Well, thank you very much for that introduction. And it probably comes over quite clearly that I'm probably more of an expert in cats than dogs. But rest assured, we're going to talk about dogs and cats this afternoon. So what I'd like to do in the first session is combine two things that are very related. First of all, how do we know they hurt? And then once we recognize that they hurt, how can we keep them comfortable? So we're going to combine that into the first session. And then in the second session, we're going to talk about how to keep them alive under anesthesia and during procedures. So some of the frequently asked questions I get um, commonly are, which analgesics are best? Um, what about non in cats? Um, single or multimodal techniques? And I'm certainly going to, on the pain management section, try and reassure you that pain management is still very simple, and very simple approaches can be very effective. Um, how long do you need to treat? I think that's a very important question. Routes of administration, and then talk about some of the newer long-acting analgesics and if they have a, a place in our acute pain management. So this talk is really focused on um, acute pain management for surgery and trauma. I think we have to ask ourselves some key questions, and one of them I think we step back and ask is, can we effectively manage pain in our patients, in our dogs and cats? Well, I think the answer is absolutely yes, because we have lots of drugs and techniques at our disposal. So I think the actually treating the pain is quite easy. I think the much harder question is that we have to actually recognize it. First of all, we have to look for it, and then actually recognize that these animals are uncomfortable. So pain, we also need to think of it as a multi-dimensional experience. We've known for a long time, and it's very easy to understand the sensory part of pain, that ouch, it hurts, but where does it hurt and how much does it hurt? But I think we're all beginning to realize more and more that there's a very, very important affective or emotional component to pain. And I really like this quote from Jackie Reed, who I'm working with on some pain scale development. Um, she says, it's not just how it feels, like ow, but how it makes you feel to be in pain. And I think there's no doubt that the emotional component of pain is very, very important in animals. So in humans, pain is what the patient says it is. Um, humans, even very young children, can self-report. They can say, it hurts here, it hurts this much, and then once you've conveyed that information, hopefully someone will help you to relieve that pain. We as veterinarians and people that look after non-verbal humans, so people that look after human neonates or people who have Alzheimer's, it's a very different thing altogether. For us working with animals, pain is what we say it is. It's whatever we decide it is because animals cannot self-report. So there's a huge onus on us to get it right because if we get it wrong, then obviously a lot of animals are going to be unnecessarily uncomfortable. The other thing we are beginning to realize, there's a huge amount of genetic factors and individual variation involved in how animals experience pain and also in their response to treatment. So a lot of you have maybe been quite frustrated where you've got this, this anesthetic and analgesic protocol that works most of the time. And then there's an animal that just doesn't seem comfortable on this protocol. Well, I see that all the time. So don't be too upset about it. It's just that it means you have to look at every animal individually. And we are now learning from our research work, especially in cats, that some of the genetic factors on metabolism, response to opioids, and so on, um, are very, very diverse. And so don't be too worried if every now and again you get a cat or a dog that just doesn't respond to what is your um, kind of set protocol. So pain assessment, currently there is no gold standard um, for assessing pain in dogs and cats. And there are actually very, very few validated scales for dogs and cats. But we're going to go through some of the work that is being done, some of the very few validated scales. And then I'm actually going to show you things that I think are important to look at when you're trying to figure out if a dog or a cat is uncomfortable. So obviously, most of us are scientists at heart. So we always like to do everything objectively. What can we measure that says this animal's in pain? And obviously, a lot of the things that have been looked at are heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure, plasma cortisol, and even the size of the pupil. And some of these things can be used in combination with observing behavior. 
But none of these things in a clinical setting have been shown to correlate closely with pain. Um, certainly in a very, very controlled research environment, cats' blood pressure did seem to be a good indicator of pain, but then the minute that was used in a clinical setting, then it didn't have any correlation. So if you think about it in cats and in dogs, things like heart rate are affected by you know, white coat syndrome and being in, in a hospital, same with um, blood pressure. Pupil size um, obviously is of no use in cats. This cat, what do you think he's had? He's had an opioid, hasn't he? So no matter what he is feeling, he could be feeling pretty comfortable, but his pupil size is pretty much dictated by the drug that he's been given. So for a long time, people have just taken you know, scales and techniques that were used in, in humans that are very simple or used in lab animals and just try to just use those to assess pain in dogs and cats. So we have things like simple descriptive scale. So you just say, go look at the animal and tell me if he's in no pain or if he's in the worst possible pain. And because we like numbers for statistics, you could just say, is it zero pain or is it five out of five? The other thing, which is maybe a little more sensitive, is to use visual analog scales. Zero, no pain, 100 um, is you know, the most pain you could observe. And then you just put a mark where you think this animal is on that scale. So the problem with these scales is we don't know whether a, scale of, uh, a score of four is twice as painful as a score of two. We don't really know that. But the biggest problem with just using something like that is everyone in this room has already probably been like thinking about this cat. Everyone here is used to looking at animals that are painful or comfortable. All of you are working with cats on a daily basis. And if I asked everybody in this room who are experts to score this cat just from this quick visual, I can guarantee we would have at least a 30 to 40% divergence in everyone's opinion. So it depends on how, what you've been taught, what you know to look for, and so on. So the problem with these scales is they call, they're, they're very, very um, inaccurate for different people to use. If the exact same person does it over and over, then they could be useful. So pain scoring system, we have to have clearly defined assessment criteria. What should you be looking for, and why should you be looking at that? And so really, all pain scoring systems for dogs and cats are based very, very heavily on understanding behavior. They need to be suitable for all observers. So in a very busy um, clinical situation, they need to be suitable for all the staff, the veterinarians, and for, in my case, students to use. They need to be simple and quick. Otherwise, they're never going to get used. They need to be sensitive, pick up animals that need intervention. They should have identified strengths and weaknesses. If the scale is good for picking up um, post-spay um, pain, is it going to pick up orthopedic pain? And then the most important thing is the scale needs to be validated. Is it measuring what we think it's measuring, or is it really only measuring the effects of anesthesia in the recovery period? That's a very important um, concept. So let's just look at this dog. This is Ty, 15 years old, ate a tennis ball, and needed a GI resection anastomosis, and this is him two days post-op. So if, I just want to show an example of what can happen if you use the wrong pain scale. So everybody kind of looked at him and probably had a gut feeling, uh, no pun intended, about how he feels. And, but if we use this one scale that was published way back in, in 96, which was never really validated, um, but someone just said, this is what dogs do when they're painful. And so if we scored um, Ty, what was he? Was he moving? No. So he gets a zero. Was he agitated? No. He was pretty calm, standing there. He wasn't vocalizing when we looked at him? Zero. Mm, I think we all kind of felt that he was uncomfortable. But basically, on this scale, he's a two out of eight, so he doesn't hurt. Was that everybody's opinion? No. So this is what can happen if you don't use good validated um, pain scales. So sometimes a snapshot doesn't give you the whole story, and we have to do a little more than just look. Um, we have to interact and do many other things and find ourselves the correct pain scoring system. The other thing is a pain scoring system should guide intervention. This is something that just irritates me a lot, to walk into the clinic and see that stuck on a cage. This cat's painful, this dog's painful, it will bite. And I'm like, well, if we know it's painful, why have we not done something? The other thing is 
that they, they should guide your intervention, but not necessarily dictate it. Because you may find that you get a very nice pain scale that works for you. You go through the system, and you, the, the dog or the cat scores a low, a, a low score. But you know that that cat or dog could look better. So don't, it shouldn't inhibit you intervening and then reassessing the animal later. So they definitely should guide, but not dictate um, intervention. So pain scoring system, it should account for the species. Obviously, a scoring system for the dog is not going to work for the cat. Kind of very different behaviors in those two different species. Sometimes I really feel like we have to account for breed. Um, do people think Labradors and Huskies act differently in the post-op period? Yes. So there's a big issue there with, um, even with breed. And then the type of pain. Where is the pain? Is it orthopedic pain? Is it abdominal pain? Um, and how long have they been painful? Is it acute pain, or is this a, a chronic pain syndrome that we're looking at? And then obviously, environmental issues, how an animal behaves at home, is going to be different from the hospital. And that's where it's very important sometimes to engage the owner, if the animal has an owner, about the animal's normal behavior at home and whether or not that has changed in the hospital. The other thing I'm finding with developing a pain scoring system for cats is that sometimes you kind of look at a cat and you go, is it pain, stress, or fear? And certainly the group I'm working with at Glasgow, we've discussed this at length. And what we've decided is that it's quite difficult, or it can be difficult to differentiate pain, stress, and fear in cats. But we've come to the conclusion that all of these are, are, are aversive. So in theory, all of these things ought to be addressed in a cat in a clinical setting anyway. But for example, we're going to go through some things that I think are important. For example, where the head is and body posture and facial expression. And these, this cat on the left has not had surgery and the cat on the right has had surgery. And for some untrained observers, they have difficulty differentiating between these two cats. Now I know exactly what's happened to each cat. I have a, a good feel for what to really look for. But some of the postures that fearful cats adopt are the same postures that painful cats adopt. So what do cats and dogs do when they're painful? That's the, the big question. And so what I want to go through is some of the work that is being done, and then go through um, what I think is important, and then try. I think you can only really get a feel for this by looking at a lot of pictures and at a lot of videos. So what we're going to do is, first of all, talk about some of the work that's been done by the group in Brazil. And so the Brondani group, what they have done is they've taken information from lots of previous studies, looked at what people have assessed um, pain with in cats, and then actually tried to validate this, uh, their pain scoring system for cats. And it, currently, they've only looked at it following ovarian hysterectomy in, in the cat. So this was published this year. It's a very, very good paper. It has a lot of good information um, in it. It goes over the importance of looking at posture, comfort, activity level, um, mental status, which um, certainly I think is important, but a lot of um, other people kind of say, well, you can't say that animals are happy or bored or so on. But I think everyone in this room, we can say that because we, we can. Um, blood pressure, they have looked at that um, as an adjunct, not as a substitute for looking at, at um, behaviors. Reaction to wound palpation is important post-surgically or post-trauma, um, not always possible. Things like appetite, vocalization, and then they have a list of miscellaneous behaviors, which are pretty interesting and very similar to what myself and the group at Glasgow have been looking at. For dogs, probably the only validated, or certainly I think it's the best validated, pain score that we have for the dog is the short form of the Glasgow Composite Pain Scale. It just happens to be where I graduated from, um, but to be honest, it really is one of the best um, scales. And there is a complete copy of this in your handout, and you can go and download it at the Glasgow University website. You just have to sign on and sign a little waiver um, because it is a copyrighted um, document. But you can easily download it at their website, and there's instructions in your handout how to, how to get this. Um, and again, somewhat similar to the CAT um, scale, they look at demeanor and response to people, posture, mobility, activity. They also think that response to touch and certainly um, the wound is very important. 
um, what the animal is doing to the wound itself, and then for the dog, vocalization um, they think is an important thing to, to assess and interpret correctly. So this form is a very simple one-page form that took um, two PhDs, one master's student, and five years to develop because it is so well validated. They started out asking veterinarians for words and descriptions of pain in dogs. There was 247 words that came in. Some of them were very, very Scottish, and we, they had to be taken out. Like, I'm guessing that none of you would know what a scunnered dog looks like. So for the international um, you know, release of this, that was taken out and turned into a, a word that everybody understands, um, and so on. And then what they did was they ended up putting the behaviors into seven, and now currently on the short form, six specific behavioral domains. So that is how much is involved in developing a, a good um, validated pain scale. Now we are currently, and I'm involved in this project, trying to develop a very similar one following the same route as the dog one for cats. So we are developing the Glasgow Composite Measures Pain Scale for acute pain in cats. Um, and we've gone through the having people send us in words. We did an online survey where people were asked to differentiate between words um, and how they related to pain in cats. Um, it is currently under construction. Um, I don't know when soon is, but we are working on this and hopefully we'll have something in the next year. So I think it's important to say, what are we looking at and why are we looking at that? So I'm going to go through um, postures, behaviors. And when I say behaviors, presence or absence of normal behaviors, but also looking for new or abnormal behaviors to develop after a surgical procedure or after trauma. We're going to look at what vocalization might mean, and then palpation of the wound, overall demeanor, interaction with a caregiver, and then I'm going to talk about some of the work we're doing on facial expression in cats, and then some of the miscellaneous behaviors, which people always say, well, what about this? And one of them I'll talk about is, what does the cat's tail tell you? And we'll show some videos of that. So look for normal behaviors. And so once you, once you know cats and dogs, and you know what normal behaviors are, you should be looking for animals in a hospital after a surgical procedure or after trauma to exhibit normal behavior. So what was that? It was the normal cat stretch, right? That is a behavior that should, you, you should see that in post-surgical patients if they're comfortable. Looking for this, so look at this cat before and after. <laughs> So you can see this cat had a flank spay, and the behavior before and after surgery was their normal behavior. He was up at the front of the cage. He wanted to play. He was interactive, um, bright and alert. So you want to look at the maintenance of normal behaviors. That's a good sign. If they look the same before and after, then your pain management protocol is good. 